Our guest today is writer-director Nazrin Chowdhury and her short film Red, White, and Blue, a short drama that features emotionally precise writing, a perceptive, even poetic eye in the directing, and a muted and somber visual naturalism fitting the financial and emotional struggles of the characters it portrays. Now that resilience and fortitude form the emotional core of Red, White, and Blue, especially when the deceptively spare, quiet tenor of its storytelling brings a powerful revelation near the film's end. It's a bold, devastating final stroke in the storytelling, one that guarantees the film, just like me, will haunt viewers well after its conclusion. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome writer, director, Nezrin Chowdhury and her Oscar shortlisted short, Red, White, and Blue. Welcome to the show, Nazrin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here speaking to you. I love hearing your interviews and watching them, so thank you. Well, thank you for the kind compliment, and I will have to say, your film, this Oscar season, is one of the very few that have left, left a lasting impression. And I think we have to keep adding the word haunting impression what inspired you to write this story? Well, <clears throat> thank you for your kind and generous words. I really appreciate it. It was a film that was uh, created to hopefully sear into your memory and uh, stay with you long after you conclude watching it. So I'm really grateful that you have said that. And I know it's moved probably a few of our audience members to tears. And I always say that I apologize for the tears, but hopefully you understand why we felt the need to tell this story and in the way that we did. Are you asking me what inspired me to write this? I don't think anyone living in the United States of America uh, cannot be aware of the fact that in 2022, the Supreme Court made a decision which effectively uh, reversed Roe v. Wade. And then that trickled down um, very quickly and it wasn't just a trickle, it went into several states uh, in such a way that legislation was being changed rapidly that was denying urgent and necessary health care to so many millions of Americans. And, you know, I was listening to news articles and, you know, if you're a woman or even it's important to say anybody who has reproductive rights because it's not necessarily just a female issue, depending on how you identify, but it does predominantly affect women. Um, you, you, you either have a lived experience of needing something like this yourself for very many reasons um, that are very valid, and um, or, or you know someone who does. So we're all living with this, and we're all living with the real world repercussions of what this decision meant for us. And I just did what I do as a storyteller, um, which is to write and understand my way through it, to understand the world I'm living in and this new world in light of this decision. And how do I grapple with the realities for um, many people, but specify it to maybe one family in Arkansas, which has, you know, um, uh, very restrictive, uh, legislation now that is denying people this access to health care. How do I tell a story that isn't judgmental, that just tries to start a conversation about what this actually really means for people um, and the human cost of it all? And I set out to just tell it in a very characterful way and to take you on a journey and to do the thing that I talk uh, about and in, in anything that I do, which is to borrow a quote from Harper Lee and To Kill a Mockingbird, which is the fact that you never fully understand a person until you climb into their skin and walk around in it. And in anything I do, that's what I try to do. And this was certainly the case with Red, White and Blue, is like, let's, let's, let's live in these characters' world for the 22 minutes of story that we tell about them um, and uh, this journey that we go on with them. You know, Nazrin, <clears throat> there, there was, a, in, in this uh, season of short films, um, there was only two, yours and another, that covered the story 
of abortion in a very different way. Um, and it helped me to appreciate that there is a mental and an emotional struggle. Um, uh, and here in America, you know, people in America, they, they are, they can be very closed minded because they only focus on what happens within their borders. And I, and I know that can happen worldwide, but what I learned was that other countries they followed Roe versus Wade. And they, you know, when the, what, you know, what is the implication going to be if, you know, at that time, if it got overturned in America, what would that mean for our country? And I never thought about like, wait a minute. So we're talking about not just a ripple in the water, but this verberated worldwide. And a lot of people don't realize that you know, yes, now we have these very strict laws in our country, but there were all, there's also very strict laws in other countries to the point that if an abortion is performed and that person is found out, they get punished, the doctor gets punished, the nurse gets punished, anybody associated with the person that knew about it gets punished. And I'm like, wow, this, this is a subject that is, that is talked about on a global scale. Yeah. You know, and for Absolutely. you, you chose Arkansas. Why, do you, why did you not choose Texas? Well, you know, there's a take your pick. Actually, I'll tell you uh, why I picked Arkansas. I, when I came up with this idea, and it literally came into my head uh, overnight, I woke up one morning and I knew that this was preoccupying me. It was clearly my subconscious. So, so much so that when I woke up one morning, um, it was a Saturday in um, July, I believe. And the idea was just immediately there. Like every single scene uh, was there. And it was just a case of sitting down and writing it. But what I did was to, I have two young daughters <clears throat> and um i basically had a walk with my eldest and laid out the story to her frame by frame and then did the same with my youngest on our i think i was dropping her off to a, a hangout with one of our friends and i ran the idea through with her because uh, and also by the way just to say as a slight segue you can hear my accent it's from the uk but I live and work in America. I am an American citizen. My two daughters are American citizens and they are set to inherit the legacy of uh, this reversal and the, the Supreme Court's decision. Um, you know, we're in California, uh, but they could easily move to another state for education, for work, for whatever reason. And none of us should ever be complacent that it couldn't happen in our state or as you're talking to all these other countries where there are um, similar issues and it's a global issue, like you say. But to come back to the Arkansas question of it all, my youngest and I, we were talking and she, because she was reading about this, knew Arkansas was um, particularly restrictive. And the idea that you have to cross two states to get through Missouri into Illinois as the nearest place that you could get this uh, procedure, the obstacles faced by someone who hasn't been out their state, but for this reason, seemed really compelling as an idea um, to just hit home how difficult it is uh, for, for people in that state. But you could tell this story in Texas. There are real life stories coming out of Texas um, you could tell it in any of the states, that, which there are multiple. This story applies, even though we've said it in Arkansas, there's a resonance for all of those other states too, just like there is a resonance across the world. And I just want to touch on something else that you said, which is, like I said, I, I'm from the UK originally, that's where I was born, but I've lived here for a considerable amount of time now, and I'm American. And I came here because America is, you know, the greatest democracy in the world, the land of the free, opportunities abound if you're willing to work hard and so on. This great American dream that 
um, always is the thing that the rest of the world is looking up to, where you can be free to make your choices, to live a life of self-determination with autonomy. Um, there is this feeling, I think, across the world as well, that if this can happen in America, then even in places like the UK, where it's seen as very normalized now, like there's no question that abortion should be uh, something that is a right to women who need it for so many different reasons, um, and to anyone who has reproductive rights. But if that can happen in America, then maybe other places where it seems like it can never happen, it could happen there too. And suddenly we're back to a situation where we have um, these marvels of medicine and healthcare workers who are actually saving lives through this procedure. They're not able to do that anymore. And we're all at risk suddenly. Yeah, you, you bring up a, a very vital point about America. And in probably, I want to say at least the last eight years, we're seeing things in this country that we would have never dreamed would have ever happened. And now the rest of the world is like, whoa, if something's happening there, it's either going to trickle to us or it'll just make things worse for countries where it's already bad. But I want to, I want to focus on this film because your storytelling is superb in this film. And Thank it's you. very, it's very subtle. It, it flows with ease and with a grace, but there is this sense of mystery and suspense that lurked under the storytelling, but then it was further enhanced by the cinematography. I mean, why did you choose this direction to take the audience along with Rachel and Maddie's emotional and physical journey? So I will say that when I wrote this, I really wanted to lean into the cinematic uh, storytelling of it all. You know, there's so much of uh, cinema that is about showing and not telling. And there's sparse dialogue um, in this. Um, as much as possible, we're trying to tell a story through our images. And I also wanted a really grounded feel to it. I have worked in TV. I started in film, actually, and always thought I would direct years back when I was a student of film school, like everybody does. Uh, I was writing then. I thought I would direct. And then I transitioned into TV, which I also really love and worked on multiple shows. And, uh, you know, you scratch that itch uh, a little bit because as a showrunner, you can work with directors who are implementing your vision in an auteur kind of way. But more than that as well, working in TV, just to answer your question, like so used to so many different angles and pickups and so on, I really wanted to get back to a style of minimalism in this film where characters are coming in to the frame and we're holding and we're letting them just, we're just holding on them. And we're not trying to do frantic camera angles or anything like that. There's a stillness to it that I, maybe it's part of my European sensibility creeping back in, but I also think it's just great cinema, I hope, that we are allowing the characters to do what they need to do, and we are allowing the storytelling to do what it needs to do, and we can just have a very grounded and real look. We wanna feel like we're a fly on the wall of these characters' lives, and to feel like this isn't glossed up in any way. This just looks like if we just, were there this is what it would look like and that's and the stillness as well yeah because and that's the stillness that makes this film work and i love films especially short films where the dialogue is very limited you know storytelling is going to be 50 percent camera and 50 percent actor but the actor doesn't actually have to talk a lot. And you, no. and you know, in the opening scene, when, when Brittany Snow is looking at the pregnancy test, you bring that stillness in because 
now she's mentally processing because if somebody's looking at the pregnancy test, they're not talking, they're not going to be rushing to their friends unless it was to them good news, but she's looking at it and that stillness brings in that mental, emotional, that, in, that internal turmoil, the decision making. What do I do now? How do I handle this? And it goes on and on. And that stillness amplifies this storyline perfectly. I'm so glad you picked up on that and you understand the artistry and the craft behind using that stillness as a juxtaposition to allow for the inner turmoil that's going on to be seen, you know, the storm of emotions that's happening that this woman is having to keep in check and under control. She's at work, there's people around her, but also, you know, ultimately where the story's going, all of those scenes are, um, if you go back and rewatch them, you'll understand even more so what's going on in her mind and having the stillness to do that and allow the characters to emote and for us to live with them. You know, the thing that I said about climbing into their skin and walking around in their shoes, that's the way we do that. And I have to really also credit my um, brilliant cinematographer, Adam Sujitsky, who I worked with on Fear the Walking Dead, but he comes from this long tradition of cinematographers. His grandfather was a cinematographer. His father is Peter Sujitsky, who is, you know, um, worked, I think he was the DP on Empire Strikes Back and did the Cronenberg movies. Um, Adam himself is a very, uh, sought after and revered cinematographer who's a master of his craft and when i sent him the script he understood what i wanted to do with it and immediately responded to it and it was so great because we were on the same page about how we wanted to tell that story and his camera work is just beautiful i mean i have to credit him with bringing so much to this because he was just such a key collaborator for me. And I am so lucky to have had him, but also some of this was to allow actors like Brittany Snow, Juliet Donenfeld, Mo Collins, Jude Tyler, Ashley Williams, you know, uh, Neil Napier, Peter Breitmeyer, all of these actors, I was so lucky to have a cast of people who are either well-known or are character actors who do exactly what they need to do for so many shows and films and have an established career they all jumped on board to do this and it was respecting them and letting them do what they needed to do without us getting in the way of that and i always think that the best stories actually you shouldn't see any of the filmmaking i love that we're talking about the filmmaking but most of the time if you do it well you shouldn't be looking at the filmmaking. You shouldn't be even seeing it unless you're looking for it because you're an artisan of the craft or because you go back and you watch it and now you're looking for those details. Well, yeah, because I'm I'm always looking at it. So like when it comes to the short films, my deal is I watch it and I, I watch it from beginning in. I watch it as if the audience is watching it. Then I go back and now it's time to dissect. This film, and from a cinematography point of view, I love films that are are dark in the cinematography. Because to me, that's harder to film than if you had a bunch of freaking lights shining everywhere. And you're, you have sunshine coming through the window. When it's dark, it's to me, it's harder. But it's also part of the storytelling. And in this case, it the subject matter is dramatic and traumatic. It is, there is a dark side per se. And the cinematography enhances all of that, which is why this film flows so well that the audience can pay attention to the story. Yeah, absolutely. And so much of that is like... Um again a credit to our cast our crew who helped with so much of that again to mention adam he's just a master at what he does and 
he really helped me to find the language of that film. And we prepped so much and talked about it so much, but we're a short film and we don't have studio resources. I mean, I literally um, had to say to my kids, it's like, hey, I might have to take from your college funds a little bit to like whatever I've saved up to make this film. And is that gonna be okay? Can I have your blessing? And they knew the importance of this story and they told me, uh, yes, of course, gave me their blessing to do that. And so I didn't have those studio resources. And so, uh, you know, when you're talking about the lighting, some a large part of that is a stylistic choice. But to give credit to Adam and to everyone who kind of worked on this film, they knew the budget that we had. And sometimes it was adapting, right? We didn't have money for all the lights either. But sometimes, uh, you know, it feeds into the style of what you want to do anyway. And you find a way to be creative and for it to just not be a curse and instead a blessing. So, I, you know, I've worked on shows that have million dollar budgets. So I know the difference between that and then what we had, which was virtually nothing. Um, so I know even on those million dollar shows where they're like, well, you, you know, you write, you write as if you had all the money in the world, but even on those shows, they suddenly tell you, Hey, you know, we can't produce this episode cause it's, you know, we're even more over budget. So you have to wind it back in, but that's well sometimes where you make the best choices because when you, it's easy to write the thing when money is limitless. It's not as easy to write the thing where you don't have the money in the budget and you're forced to be creative. And actually being forced to be creative in that way sometimes leads to better storytelling. You, you, you took the words out of my mouth because what I, and I've heard this time and time again, where, you know, either we didn't have the budget or we couldn't get maybe a piece of equipment that we really, really wanted. But I think what that does is that being limited in certain resources in filmmaking causes the director, causes the cinematography, maybe even the actor, to figure out a way to use what they have. And in many cases, from, and I've heard this over and over again, when they go into the editing room, they sit back and go, oh my gosh, we did it. Or that turned out better than I thought. What yeah. you can imagine. And then it's like, wow, because I think the learning experience is enhanced for the next project by being limited in, in certain areas when it comes to filmmaking. And I think that just causes the filmmaker to be better the next time they do it. Yeah. And I can use even a different example um, to illustrate what we're discussing, which is that carousel scene. Um we basically had this carousel, uh, not for even a full day. And we had some daytime scenes that we need to shoot on it and some nighttime scenes. Of course, when we then went to the nighttime scenes and we tried to put the lights on the carousel, which doesn't see much action. And it was difficult enough to find an elephant on a carousel, which is an important story point for us. Um, but we found it. Um, and we had everything ready to go. And we have child actors who have schedules um, that we have to be respectful of, rightly so. And it breaks, suddenly it breaks down. And we can't do the scene in the way that we had imagined doing it. And even though um, I, I'm not sure how much we can go into the detail of um, that scene because of the way that scene is set up, I, what I can say is, the result of how we end up doing it. And that was me having to pivot in real time, like 20 minutes of filming left. Um, we had this whole carousel fairground, our production designer had done this amazing job. We ended up not having time to film some of the, you know, beautiful kind of setting that they had created for us because we had to figure out this problem and get it done in rapid time. And so I came up with this story idea of like, okay, this is what we'll do with this stationary carousel at nighttime. And we'll tell the story this way instead, where we're going back into, uh, there's a memory that Brittany Snow is recalling at that time. Yes. And we go into it. And actually the way we ended up doing it, the scenes between past and present 
was better storytelling than I had written in the script itself. And I was just forced into that decision. And, uh, you know, I think everyone was panicking at that point. It was the last day of filming. We're about to lose Juliet. We really needed to get this done. And I think that is um, maybe the years of experience of being on a TV set and having to rewrite at the last minute. You know, or think things the, that the, helped. Yeah, the, the carousel scene, when I think back about it, it's almost like you're tripping up the audience because now the audience is thinking, wait a minute. Okay. What's going on here? So she has, she had a kid. So what's with the pregnancy test? And so not that it's an actual twist, but it's in a way of holding the audience back until the revelation comes. And, and it's a beautiful scene. But at the same time, it didn't have to be a long scene. Like you said, it's a short film. It's 22 minutes long. Uh, but it worked beautifully. And it, Thank also, you. and it also goes back to the financial hardship. Because so Rachel is, is, is telling Maddie, we, basically, I only have enough money for one ride. And, and then she picks the carousel. And and that goes back to Arkansas, never been out of state, a uh, waitress job, funds are always low, it's paycheck to paycheck. But yeah, she, I mean, she can't even think about the tooth fairy money. No, because every second yeah, she but she wanted to show Maddie. The journey she's about to go on. Yeah, she wanted to bring some joy to Maddie, even if it was That's one that, right. ride. And I'll tell you, like I'm a big believer in um, telling storytelling in threes, right? So there's the school uh, fundraiser event with the pancakes in the cafe. And she says no to Maddie at that point. You know, can we go? And she says, no, we've got food for free here. Because I know people in my own, my kids went to public school. I know that some people are struggling to put meals on the table at night. They don't have time to go to fundraisers where, yes, it's great that the school gets money, but they can't afford to have, you know, they can't go to whatever restaurant that's going to donate um, to them. So she has to say no. And then there's the scene in the road trip where they're passing through uh, Missouri and there's an advert with the zoo and she's like, can we go? And we just see it in those visuals. She's saying, no, this is a mother who has to say no so much. She gets tired of saying no because you just want to give joy to your children and remember them as children. And so that moment is supposed to be a real kind of build up to the moment where she's able to say yes and see the joy of her child. And this film, as much as it's about abortion, I think I've said this before to other people and I'm happy to say it again here, it's actually a celebration of motherhood and what it means to be a mother. And I think that moment at the carousel was really important for me to land that specific sentiment. And you did. And no spoiler alerts here, ladies and gentlemen, but you did just that. And for you, what did you see in actress Brittany Snow to bring Rachel to life? You know, well, look at our film and watch it and you will see what I knew she could do for this role. And boy, did she do it. Um, I just can't even imagine anyone else in this role now. And I know that this is probably a different role than many of the roles she's done in her very illustrious career to date. Um, she herself has spoken about the fact that this was the first time she was playing a mother, even though she's in very much in the age bracket of uh, someone who could be a mother. Um, those are kind of her words that I'm taking um, and giving you here. But I, I just know, I just, I've, everything I've watched her in, she holds your attention. I think she draws your eye. And even in something like Pitch Perfect, right, you see Brittany uh, playing a role. Well, her and best physical, it, her best physical feature is her eyes, and that yes. is that's what she used, and that's what we all focused on when we watched this film. And she is so brilliant. 
I cannot tell you, given that we had such a tough schedule and short time frame to do this in, it really helped to have an actress like Brittany uh, and Juliet also playing alongside her. We just, again, I had to give a hat tip to my casting directors for uh, um, finding us Juliet and Reading and so on. Brittany was already someone who was on a very early wish list of mine. And my casting directors also uh, had her on a, a wish list when I had approached them about this. So when we were talking about it, it was like, oh, we think Brittany Snow. And I was like, oh my God, she's on my list. Um, and like, do you think it's even possible? Because she's just, yeah, she's just very sought after, very in demand. And um, we all know why. And if we didn't know before, we should know now because I just think she is one of the best actresses working today. I think your film has elevated her career. Because when I think of Britney Snow, I'm thinking of all the, the fun movies, the fun characters. But this is a complete turn. She does it so well that if they were to if they were handing out nominations for actors and actresses in short films, she would win. I totally agree. And actually, you know, this film has been scripted and developed very precisely in such a way that I wanted to deliver the impact of and depth of a 90 minute feature in the span of 22 minutes but hopefully only feels like five minutes in the watching because there's a transportive quality to it. And so to me, um, if they allowed short films in to the best actress category, I truly, without bias, believe Britney should be up there. And I don't think anyone who's watching this film could argue with that. Oh, because no, what they I, see, I, what she does with this, they should be blown away and she should be, you know, she should, she should be crowned for what she is and what she brings to this. I, I completely agree, but I have got to ask you because how, for you as a director, how did you direct Juliet about the serious subject matter? Yeah. I mean, it's not just Juliet. We had other children on um, the um, film as well, who, we had to approach very sensitively and you know it's a it's a very important subject matter and you're right with Juliet because she plays such a prominent role in this like how do you approach this subject matter um I've spoken about this before um but just to reiterate they have brilliant families they have mothers who basically uh really look out for them and knew what the story was and needed to be. Uh, when we were casting for the children, we sent out the sides and we just, you know, saw who our picks were and Juliet stood out, um, as did Reading Munsell, you know, as very clear and easy choices of people we wanted to work with. And that's a credit to them because those two young actors are phenomenal. Uh, we also have Sloane Muldown, who's, well, uh, who's in our film too. All of our child actors are just brilliant and wonderful. What we then did was we sent the script to their families and gave them the whole script and said, read this and come and talk to us and let us know if you're comfortable with this or if you're not comfortable with this. We want you to fully know what the story is and have full access to discussing it with us to see if this is something you want to do. And they read it and they signed up and were, you know, really believe in this message. You know, we talk, there's a theme of elephants in our film and this herd of elephants, you know, it's a matriarchal society that looks out for one another and protects one another. Well, I can say I have this herd of elephants uh, that is both on the screen, but off the screen in terms of these families. In fact, they're all coming over to my house on Sunday. We're going to hang out. We're going to play board games right before the school holidays um, uh, end. Uh, 
and they're back to school after the winter break of it all. My kids are going to hang out with their kids. We're going to just have lunch and just hang out. But they are like a, my tribe. And those moms are so phenomenal that they talked their kids through it all, protected them as they needed to. And then it was also having access to me to understand um, that they could talk to me at any time. We could talk things through. Uh, just under, And they're smart. They're intelligent kids, emotionally very mature. Juliet had already done something in this arena as a PSA. So she had a strong understanding of that. And her mom has worked in healthcare. So um, I was just very lucky that somehow someone was looking out for me, that they brought all of the perfect people into my orbit at the right time to tell this story. And I can't help but thinking maybe someone up there is looking out for me because they understand why we need to tell this story and why it was so important to tell this story. You know, the, the, film, the film takes the audience on a uncomfortable journey, but you take us completely over the edge with a twist at the end. I mean, were you trying to make a political statement with that twist? No, not necessarily in the sense of everything is political, right? To have a view on something, to live, you know, Aristotle talks about man being a political animal and we'll extend that to meaning man, woman, child, whatever, because, uh, you know, it's from the Greek word polis, right? To, to, which means of the people. And in fact, our constitution is set up that way to be of the people, for the people, by the people. I'm sure I've got the order wrong, but you get no, what I'm you saying. No, you did well. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Um, so to me, it was like, okay, let's tell a human story and actually tell a story that transcends the political divide, actually. And shows you what it means like okay we can talk about these things in theory and we can have our politics but what does this mean in reality you know and that i think the story is like set up so we show all the reasons why someone could want or need this procedure and hopefully it feels valid and then when we get to where the story is going there's this whole other curveball, which if you didn't sympathize before, maybe you'll sympathize now. It's really about tapping into your humanity. That's what I was trying to do. And it, it does. And it does. It causes everyone to think. It causes a lot of other people to rethink. And I, and I'm don't, and I don't want to give, I don't want to give the twist away. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to wait when, when it comes time for you to, to see red, white, and blue, you're just going to have to watch it for yourself. But I have to hand it to Brittany because in the particular scene when she's standing in the clinic, she's standing there at the nurse's station and the nurse is taking the information. And the one thing that Brittany says, and I'm not going to say it because it'll give it away. She says one particular thing and the nurse just looks at her like, did I hear you right? And Brittany stands there not actually knowing what that nurse is going to think, say, or do. That scene was when I sat there and I watched just that one short clip. I was like, oh my God. I never saw it coming. The film left me well, a bit haunted. Um, for you, what has been the reaction from the audiences who have seen this film? Pretty much the same. Um, you know, that they don't see it coming. And when they do, it's a visceral gut punch. And I won't shy away and deny that that was exactly what I was hoping to do, is to land that punch. Um, because the story deserves it. And it's not sensationalist. It's not uh, set up to be a twist, actually, even. The story um, was there all along. People refer to it as a twist. And I, I'm happy for people to say it that way and to actually talk back in those terms, too. But just to say, for me, it, the story was there all along for anyone who could see it. And 
honestly, some people might even say, oh, I could see it coming. I don't think they do. Maybe no. because now people are talking about twists and so on. Maybe they have an inkling because they're looking for it. And that's fine. There but is no there's no way, Nazrin, there is no way that any audience member would sit there and go, I saw that coming. There's no way. The way that you directed this film, the way you wrote it, the way that it was shot, no one is going to see this coming. I also like the fact that you said you weren't there to sensationalize. And, you know, we're probably going to hear people go, oh, that would never happen. Really? You haven't yeah. been reading the news. More often than you think, actually. And tragically so. Yeah. And, and so I also have to give a credit to Jude Tyler, who plays the nurse, and give a big shout out to healthcare workers who are working in this field, who are overwhelmed, who are exhausted, who are not not compassionate. They are entirely compassionate. But she says in that clinic, yeah, you and everyone else from that state and all the other ones too. She's not unsympathetic. It's just the system is at breaking point. The infrastructure is overloaded and they are, tr they are running to stand still. They are not sleeping. And I really want to acknowledge all the health workers out there who are helping in any way they can, sometimes at the risk of their own lives, actually, because there are people who are very extreme um, in their views and that's not where we any of us should be. This should always be about humanity. And um, I think Jude Tyler really is the audience in that moment. And we are reacting with her in real time. That was really what I wanted to um, set it up to do. And I really appreciate all your words and how you're speaking about this farm because, you know, those visuals, there are multiple layers of storytelling that are going on prior to that moment and even after that moment that are very deliberate, very thought through. Like I said, the dialogue is sparse. And in fact, I don't know if you noticed, the dialogue is all women. And um, other than the young, unadulterated voice of uh, Jake, I chose to give the platform and the voice to the people whose reproductive rights are affected, which is largely women. So in the song, in the car road trip scene, by the way, um, that's a song by uh, Wayward Sons uh, and it's male vocals on that. And the lead singer of that happens to be a family member and I was struggling to find a song. I had a placeholder of Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Wanna Have Fun. And I know Cindy Lauper is really active in this um, space, but it was just not having the time or the ability to reach out and get that permission from that song. And, you know, it's very difficult anyway, because artists don't always have ownership over their own songs anyway. Anyway, I won't go into all of that. Suffice it to say, the week before filming, I'm like, how do I have this fun road trip scene between mother and daughter? Um, you know, uh, You know, she's left her child behind, her son, because she's managed to get childcare for him. We hear the friend saying, oh, I'm sorry, I can't take both of them for you. And she's saying, don't worry, honestly. And so they're on this road trip together and they're singing, how do I get a song? And he happened to be traveling with his wife around the world and was in LA the week before um, we were filming. And my daughters who actually write and compose and sing themselves, I had told them, hey, can you write me a song? And they were busy, like one was applying to college and like dealing with all of that stuff and finals. Um, and so we were coming up against it. He was there, said, do you want one of my songs? And I said, right, but I'm trying to do this thing where I have only female voices. He said, not problem. Re-recorded my girl's vocals over uh, the song. And so that's what's coming through the car scene and the road trip. So it's very personal, this movie too. But then even the songs by um, Alex Clark and Phil Medley that are playing in the diner, those also had, they were so generous to loan us their songs. Those had male vocals. They went and re-recorded female vocals because as much as possible, I wanted it to be mainly female voices on this other than Jake's. And that is, he is a symbol 
of the hopeful future in which we have allies and Jake having experienced what, you know, his family has gone through and being surrounded by the females in his life uh, and knowing how this is going to affect them or may affect them. And he's none the wiser at this age, but he will be much the wiser in the future. He's our hope. And so he's the only male speaking role in this. Just brilliant. Literally, Nazrin, completely brilliant. And, you know, when I think back now about all those little things that you mentioned, I'm like, ah, it just makes sense. But it enhances the film that much more. Um, yeah, and so much of it is deliberate. Um, to, you know, like I said, like Mo Collins is in this and she plays the female diner. And Mo and I worked at Fear the Walking Dead. And, you know, all of my characters, even Stella, the friend who comes to her rescue, takes care of her son. I wanted those characters to feel fully realized and like people in, like women helping one another and seeing one another. But also, as for example, Mo's character, Margot the Diner, goes off screen. It's very deliberate and crafted in such a way like, why did this woman see this other woman? What's her story? What happened to her that means she understands this situation? And maybe in another word, would follow her and tell her story. But we're, yeah, not focused on that's, that. we're focused on this story. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking because in the in the diner scene, so she had waited on this older woman, and the older woman just looks at her and, and re, it almost just reads right through her. And and that and to me, it's that scene where you you keep the audience contained in the story. You keep them contained. They don't know what's coming. Just that one scene keeps us thinking, okay, um, it's all about it's all about Rachel. And so we ride that Rachel wave until the clinic. And and you kept it together. You didn't give us a you didn't shine a light. You didn't even give us a hint. That's why this film is is just a beauty to watch. And ladies and gentlemen, for all of you who are filmmakers, you dream about being a filmmaker, you're going to film school, red, white, and blue, this is a lesson in filmmaking. Oh, that's This so is a generous. lesson in screenwriting. And this is a lesson in putting it all together uh, cause you know, that's the thing about, I like about, uh, you know, Nazem, that's one of the things that I liked about the short films this season was that many of them, you know, you got the surprise at the end, you know, with the, with a short film, I don't want to see a film to where I've already figured it out within the first five minutes, you know, or somebody sends you the synopsis of the tagline. And once you read the tagline, you already know the whole film. I want to be, I want to, I want to be surprised or shocked, or that warm, fuzzy feeling at the end, which is not your film. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but... There is a hopefulness to it at Yes, the end. no, no, there, no, there is, there is, and... But yes, of course, agree. If, if anyone, a anyone, I'm not going to say if, anyone that watches this film, they are going to have to, depending on how they believe or what they think, or what their opinions are, they're going to have to rethink a bit. And, and I think that's the message you brought with this film, is that we have to step back and go, oh, we need to rethink this a bit. And, yes. and it causes people to think. And sometimes, maybe it does take a little bit of shock value to, to jolt someone to go wake up. Or have you ever thought of this? And this is that film. And you stand, you. You, this film stands, it stands above, it stands alone in the 15 Oscar shortlisted films. You know, because, you know, I know films that, that I probably would have not put on the shortlist. Um, there are films that should be on the shortlist. You're 
yours deserves that place on the short list. You you earned it. Thank you. you belong there. Thank you so much. That's so nice to hear and so validating. And I'm so grateful to the Academy and the Academy members for seeing this film. You know, there's so many films that qualify before the shortlist and you're not sure if anyone's even watching or seeing it, but clearly they did and they put us on that list. And it's gratifying because I haven't stopped working 18 to 20 hour days on this film since I started it in July. Every day I've worked on this film to some extent and I continue to put 18 to 20 hour days on it, which like, you know, thank God for lighting. Um, but yeah, I, and I we still even now don't necessarily have the resources uh, that, you know, uh, many films do even in this category, but we're just grateful that the Academy recognized it and that that means an audience will find it. And the thing that you were saying about it causes you to rethink, hopefully it causes you to rethink, but then also have a conversation. Like I didn't come here to be preachy. I didn't even want to preach to the choir about any of this stuff. Sometimes these films, you make them and it's like preaching to the people who already get it. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to kind of extend this olive branch I don't even know if that's the right way to say it, but I don't no, know. No, no, you did. You did. When, when, after I watched the film, I sat there and I went, I get it. I get it. And if someone says, and if anybody has a negative attitude um, about it because they're so staunch in their beliefs, um, they, I want to go back to my word. They need to rethink. Um, because you weren't preachy, um, it's in a way the storyline can be and has been factual in real life. So it's not yes. made up. It's not fantasy. It happens. And like you said, more, more, more times than we would care to admit, but you're not preachy at all. This, this was a beautiful film. The story was amazing. Uh, but I have to ask you. Uh, I read where Samantha B has signed on as an executive producer. Explain to us what does that mean in the Oscar process and what does that mean for your film? Well, she's joined us as, as an executive producer and she's someone who has championed, uh, you know, access to abortion and protecting those rights for a really long time. She speaks so intelligently about it. She speaks so compassionately about it. In fact, I think she has a podcast. Um, I don't even think, I know she has a podcast um, that she released last year, uh, talking about this in quite some depth. And she's been talking about this for a really, really long time. You know, the Oscars and that campaign is one thing and we're so thrilled that she's joined it. Um, and it hopefully, assists us in people realizing how important this is and why this film allows you to think about it in a different way. Um, and it's interesting because she deals in the factual world um, and I'm working in this scripted world. And you know, there are many documentaries around this topic as well. And I work mostly in scripted and I love documentaries. I watch them quite a bit myself. But I think what documentaries sometimes do is, is they're informative or what they do is people resist them. They resist them because it feels like it's trying to give you a message that you don't want to hear. Um, and maybe you should hear it. Um, so there's no critique in the documentary in that way. It's more about how audiences access it. There's confirmation bias and you tend to go towards the things that you, um, sometimes it's educational, but and informative and you're trying to learn something through it, but sometimes it's because it feeds into your belief system already. So you end up having the same audiences who already, it's not, it's, it's how do you change the needle? It doesn't the challenge the mindset. And I think with scripted, what happens though, is you suspend disbelief because it's not real. Even though there are real life stories like this for real, this is fictional we know that these characters are fictional. So it gives us a space to not feel challenged or confronted and move closer to the story and move closer to the characters where we don't 
we can just go on this journey with them. And in going through that journey with them, we are dealing with this intangible uh, quality that storytellers in the fictional space like I trade in, which is empathy. Like, can I move you to think, to feel so much that it forces you to think? And maybe then it's that thing again of walking and climbing into someone's skin and walking around in it. If you've had the opportunity to do that, what do you now think? And I'm not telling you what to think. Like I have no desire to tell someone how to vote other than please protect everyone's right to freedom. Yeah, but you and did. So that's, what, that's why this film with the subject matter but you brought the message. You were easy with it. I mean, even even with even with the revelation uh, at the end, you were again. You weren't preachy. People will watch this film, and ladies and gentlemen, if you have not had the opportunity to see it yet, and when it does come available to the public, you do need to sit down. You need to watch it, and just let it wash over you, and. <laughs> You'll in know fact, exactly what I mean. <laughs> and in fact, it's available right now until the Janu until January the 16th on uh, YouTube uh, via the Omeletto channel. I oh, think. yeah, Omeletto. Uh, yes. E yeah, excellent Right place. now, but only till January the 16th because we actually wanted to give access to the public, to this film, in stark contrast, actually, to the lack of access they have to the healthcare itself. It felt like the least we could do is open up this film um, to them. Um, but yeah, we're not really, um, trying to be preachy in any way, but we are trying to start a conversation about what this really means. I love that. I love that. And uh, Nazrin, what does it mean to be on the Oscar shortlist? You know, I am so honored, um, for myself, for the film, for the cast and crew that worked so hard on it, for them to be recognized because so many people gave so much to this um, above and beyond. Again, short film budget. And so many people pulled in so many favors to tell this story. It means a great deal to us. And I know we are in a category with some, you know, phenomenal filmmakers who I have watched their films and admired their films. And to be in that same category with them is really important. And what's even more um, just overwhelmingly, uh, I don't even know how to speak about it. Because well, well, let, let, me, let me ask you this. When, when the short list was announced, yes. how long did it take you to maybe give the thought of, if I get nominated, what am I going to wear? Do you know what? If we get nominated, I... I can only pray and wish we go go all the way. Um, I'm trying not to think about that because, you know, our film is going to have a life even whether we get uh, a nomination or not because we told this story for a really important reason. Um, and we told it in a characterful way. We led with story, we led with character. And I think hopefully that's why it's on the short list because it's an important subject matter, but we do it hopefully with grace and pathos. At least that was the intention. You, you did. You did. And you know, it's funny because- I, I hope I'm having another conversation with you where you're asking me, now what are you wearing? Because we got nominated. I hope it goes all the way because what? I feel like it would be the most rewarding thing for this cast and crew who did everything they could to make sure that this was told. Well, you know, it's funny because with so many film direct directors that I've talked to, I have some where they're very superstitious and they're like, uh, don't say it. And then, <laughs> and then others are more like they can visualize it. And for me, I'm a dreamer. I'm like, you know, dream, think of yourself, hearing them call your name out, walking to the stage, holding it into your hand. And who knows, maybe pre-write your speech just as a way of, I believe this can happen. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, as they like to say, I hope that that is the situation we're in. Uh, I know we are working really hard to make sure everybody sees it. And again, uh, I think Academy members are really um, 
they have a lot to watch and they do so much work to make sure that people are honored even to this level to the shortlist and so everyone who voted for us everyone who watched us i'm so eternally grateful to you because you're shining a light on our film as well by doing so and more people will see it and more conversations will change and art is supposed to connect with society and it's supposed to change the world and you know across the world as well we're seeing arts programs being rolled back you know budgetary cuts being made and we cannot lose our ability to tell stories we cannot lose our ability to have the arts reflect the real world but also for art for life to end up imitating art in the sense that change is where it happens art helps to change the world and honestly i worked in the political field for a short while um back in the uk and i realized i could change more hearts and minds with the stories i told which is why i'm in this field and so i'm so grateful to the academy that they understood what we were trying to do with this story and that they saw the craft that went into it and the love and the passion and the immense hard work and yeah uh, I'm a dreamer too, so I hope I get to carry on dreaming. Hey, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, Red, White, and Blue is one Oscar shortlisted film that is cleverly written. It's directed with precise focus that takes the audience to a place it didn't expect to go. And the acting, well, like I said, if they gave out Oscars for acting in a short film, Brittany Snow would win it, hands down. The subject of abortion divides many, and the ending twist takes advantage of the uncomfortable silence surrounding the narrative subject matter. And the narrative provokes thought about the larger circumstances that have shaped the story beyond the screen. It's a bold move. And then again, one that guarantees the film will haunt viewers well after its conclusion. So, Nazrin, I want to thank you for sharing your film with us today and much success to you in 2024. Thank you so much. And thanks for asking such thoughtful questions that allowed me to go into so much depth uh, about our film and the filmmaking uh, that existed behind it. I, it was such an honor and a pleasure to speak to, with you. Uh, thank, I, and I want to thank you, Nazrin, because, you know, that's the whole point of our program is to not just talk about the film, but to actually talk about the parts of the film, to talk about the cinematography and, and the direction that you took to bring this, your own, this story, this story to life. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, you go to YouTube. Omeletto is the site you want to go to and you can watch right now, red, white, and blue, and you need to watch it. Uh, and you may want to get some of your friends together and sit there and watch it. Maybe, tra you know, get it onto your big screen TV and sit there and understand that there's a, well, there's a whole nother side to every story. And it's filmmakers like Nazrin that gives us that other side. Shocking, perhaps. But sometimes we got to get shocked to maybe, uh, maybe change our mindset a bit. Maybe bring understanding to very tough subjects that are tough to talk about uh, in the midst of today's society. And Nazrin, well, she's done exactly that. Is it Oscar worthy? Absolutely. Without a shadow of a doubt. Red, white, and blue. I would not be surprised. And and I, I, try, I try to be as unbiased as I can in film, but I would not be surprised that in the matter of days... A nomination could be handed out. There's only five slots available. Red, white, and blue has a very, very strong substance to it. Um, could definitely Thank make you it on so that much list. again for saying that. And uh, uh, if it wasn't clear, this is also my directorial debut, so I'm thrilled even more. Thank you. I, and see, I love that. I've talked to so many first-time directors, and now they're on the Oscar shortlist. You... I mean, that's how much talent we have in this world today. And I've got to say this before we go. And Hollywood, you better be listening. Academy, you better be listening. 
the Directors Guild, and the Writers Guild. We need more female filmmakers. They have the talent. Uh, hey, we could go to the equal pay uh, subject as well, but the deal is this. They're not second-class citizens. They are talented. They can out-direct men at the drop of a hat. Everybody's equal. Everybody's creative. Everybody has a story to tell. Everybody has a different eye for what they see in the camera and through that camera. And look, let's all work together and make the film industry better than ever. We've already gone through, what, three three or two and a half strikes uh, in the past year. It's time that we yeah. all come together. Hey, and Nazar, you know this. The film community can be a very tight community, one that supports one another. But we need to do more to support female filmmakers like Nazrin and others out there that are doing just tremendous work that deserves not only praise, deserves awards too. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, for watching. You can catch all the replays of our interviews with the top film directors like Nazrin and producers and screenwriters as well as the actors. You can catch more of it on our YouTube channel, Bond on Cinema, and we're also available on a dozen audio platforms as well. I want to thank you for watching and listening. And as for me, I hope to see you at the movies. And who knows, maybe I'll see you on the red carpet.